15 people are listening. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation. It's a really tremendous pleasure to be the, a part of this great school. Um, and I'm going to be, my original topic sounded like ECOG and MEG for speech mapping and decoding and closed loop motor interfaces. I decided to focus a little bit more on ECG only stuff because um, otherwise it would be just too much of materials. I'll show you one small evidence from MEG related to speech decoding, but it will be rather negative, uh, negative evidence than something constructive. Uh, and I would also like to list numerous affiliations of mine because I'm a professor at the National Research University High School of Economics in Moscow. And there we have established a center for bioelectric interfaces, uh, which, was, which was created for the funds obtained by Mikhail Lebedev uh, via, uh, via mega grant of the Russian, uh, Russian government and uh, Ministry for Education, for Science and Education. And I'm also part of the Artificial Intelligence Research Institute um, in Moscow, where we focus on some artificial intelligence aspects like deep neural networks and stuff for analysis of EEG, uh, not only EEG, but my group focuses on EEG. And we've been supported by Huawei in our effort for ECUG based speech decoding. Okay. So in this talk, I will uh, basically might title now would probably sound like a CUG motor and speech decoding with interpretable neural networks. And I would like to focus more on uh, more on methodological aspects. Okay, given this fantastic, fantastic uh, talk by Tanya Schultz, uh, which combined both great, great introduction and impressive results, I will now somehow narrow into what is in the guts, what is under the hood uh, between the ECUG data and the, 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 the speech decoding and motor decoding. Although our results are not as great as Tanya's, but we've been in this in the speech decoding at least for like for, for, for at most like maybe one, one and a half year. So we hope we will improve soon. Uh, and um, yeah, so a couple of more words about the center that the center itself was indeed is involved in many activities and you can split them in three main groups, neural interfaces, neural feedback and neural visualization. Um, and my talk today is touching only this invasive motor and speech decoding aspect. Okay, so they, of course, it's the work it would be impossible without the great team. Uh, and those are my students, my colleagues. Uh, Mikhail Lebedev is the, the one who obtained the funds for the, for the center to start. Uh, and below is our clinical team at in, in Moscow at one of the uh, at one of the hospitals. It's Vladimir Krylov and Mikhail Sinkin, MD. Uh, and Nastasia Arhipov is in St. Petersburg and Palenova Institute, who is helping us to get access to the patient and you know, with many other aspects, okay? So, well, the the main project for the lab when it was just created uh, was to design the bidirectional neural interface, motor neural interface where we would decode from motor cortex and then stimulate the sensory cortex to provide some sort of tactile feedback, okay? So again, this, clinical people. Uh, but uh, in order to solve this task, we first established the, um, we first created the um, uh, setup, uh, uh, which to which we recently added GTEC amplifier, and we are very happy about it. Uh, and so the, 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 the setup contained basically ECOG and EMG grids, multi-channel EMG grid as well, which we use as a proxy for before we go for the patients, we do the same experiments with, uh, with electromyography and we are able to decode very nicely between the right is a true decode, a true, true location, true movements and the left is um, uh, the decoding from the, from the surface EMG. Um, we are really able to sample from about 2.5 by 2.5 square area, we're able to sample up to 10 to 12 independent components that basically encode movements of fingers and the strands, and it works actually very nicely. So, but that's our proxy before we get, so we can streamline all the procedures. Then this data I go into the software that integrates the, uh, the electrophysiological data, video data, and the data which come from the from the, from the tracking devices like video tracker or perception neuron based tracker uh, that capture the kinematics. And we process it with our stations uh, that contain NVIDIA boards, which we need to train some deep learning networks or you know, handle large amounts of data. 
Okay, so the task is pretty straightforward. So given the ECOG data and given the finger velocity, and when these two are synchronized, uh, decode finger velocity from the ECOG data. Okay, so we work with patients who were implanted for medical reasons with ECOG grids, uh, and those are usually epilepsy patients. We of course have some questionnaire. We select these patients for them to be to be intellectually intact. And also we of course ask them if they're interested in playing these different games with us. So they usually are because they kind of getting bored when they are implanted with these electrodes and wait till the seizure comes. Okay. So uh, I'll show you first the results approximately what we get then in, including the real time decoding and um, then I will go into the gut survey. Okay, so for, we have several patients um, and for this one we implemented real time Decoding the uh, the decoding the the the, the, decode, the decoded trace of a single finger is seen as blue one is the blue trace on the bottom and the um, the uh, the actual movement um, is you know the, the black one. So in if you if you run it how it looks, so you have to look at the finger and the, this finger is it's on the screen. It's something that has been decoded. You can see a different pace works and also also without this pen then works. Uh, we work, we, we didn't train the patient almost. So the good idea would be to spend about like at least like several days with the patient to train the patient to use the interface. But we did, we did pre-train, we did train her a little bit uh, because when we just uh, collected the data and trained our decoder, and attach it in real time, it simply wouldn't work, wouldn't work at all. And so we had to show on the screen the profile that we want her to follow. And she was following this profile. And then we recorded it and recorded the data, trained the decoder, then showed this profile, a new profile again. And after several attempts, uh, she kind of understood how to consciously move her finger and things started to work. Okay, so therefore I want to emphasize that the very important component in designing this kind of interfaces is how to train the patient after and together the patient and the machine. And this is a separate topic, uh, which, uh, which, which I believe needs to be, um, needs to be attended quite carefully. Okay, so let's go into a little bit of mathematics. Uh, I am, because it's a school, right? I understand that I need to somehow to present a little bit of some boring material, uh, but also I believe that out of 600 people plus who are listening, uh, I will find some small subgroup who are who is interested in the algorithmic details, okay? So the idea basically is this, that we have a neuronal tissue, right? And we have populations G sub i and A sub i, and these neuronal populations are those that are labeled with G are producing the activity that is task related and those which are labeled with A producing the activity which is not task related. And it's very well may be that the fraction of A's and G's is in fact very different and very little of G's and a lot of A's, okay? Uh, but somehow this, the activity of these G's gets combined into a very complex function, which results then into the behavior, which results into the, into the movement and into the signals to the muscles and those turn get turned into the movement of, of let's say fingers okay so we also believe that we are will be focusing on some rhythmic activity and we believe that the instantaneous power of the rhythmic activity is something that carries the information okay but uh, the observed data uh, follow very stereotypic model that is used in electrophysiology and, and magnetoencephalography EEG and MEG data analysis where our measurements, X vector of measurements at each of the electrodes is basically comprised as a sum of, uh, of, of sources. Uh, each source has topography G sub I, just simply a vector with which this source impinges on the sensors. Basically, if the source is active with unit activity, then it impinges on the sensors with vector G. And so I split the two populations of uh, sources. The first population is task related, the other one is not, okay? So this is important because uh, we will be talking about interpretation of the rules learned by the decoder and the fact the presence of this second population is extremely important, okay? So then we want to apply to these time series, we want to apply a decoder so that some uh, estimate of 
the movement of Z is obtained and the decoder is trained based on the difference between the actual movement and, and, and the, um, the, 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 and the output, and its output, okay? So, uh, all right. So we would like to, we would like, we, we, when, we, when we started doing this, we actually wanted to do so-called domain grounded approach. So we wanted to use, on the one hand, we wanted to create a system that would not require manual feature engineering. On the other hand, we would like to restrict the system to, to use basically, or to exploit to some extent, the, 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 the knowledge that is available in the domain, okay, which is neurophysiology, right, in this case. So basically, uh, we believe that the activity of spatially localized neuronal population uh, can be, is important, and it can be extracted by so-called spatial filtering, which lies in simply linearly combining the signals from the sensors into a single time series, okay, such as this one, for example. Also, we believe that band-specific neuronal oscillations carry distinct pieces of information, and therefore we are interested in some different narrow band signals, right, such as the one we've seen here, and its envelope here, its envelope, carries information about the extent to which specific neuronal population that gets filtered out by this spatial filter, okay, is active, okay? Then uh, also when we will be interpreting the results, it is a, and we will be trying to sleep well so that we know that our results do not come from muscles or from other kind of artifacts, we need to know some physiological properties of neuronal, neuronal signals. And this is, in particular, that the the larger spatial the larger spatial extent of a neuronal population, the low frequencies it will have tendency to be active at. Okay, like in this picture, you can see that uh, horizontal lines are electrodes, and those are frequency. And you can see what happens during the uh, movement with alpha, beta, and gamma components. So you can see that alpha desynchronizes over a relatively large area. Okay. And then beta desynchronizes over smaller area. And also not interesting that these areas are not ex overlapping, but only partly, right? This is interesting. This is our own result from it's published in Frontiers back like three years, four, four years ago. Uh, and then also you see gamma synchronization, but gamma synchronization occurs very focally, okay? So if we have higher frequency, we usually tend to have focal activity, okay? Uh, and uh, that's the, an interesting, interesting plot that I found several days ago, but I've been thinking about it and it's exactly confirmed. My hypo hypothesis is that muscular artifacts when measured by ECOG, and this is jaw artifact, this is from the jaw muscles, okay? Uh, they have high frequency occupation, but they tend to spread over large number of electrodes. So this is in contradiction with what we would see for a neuronal source and this, when the neuronal source properties and spatial extent is properly interpreted. Uh, this allows us to make conclusions that what we are decoding from is not muscles, right? Is not a muscle, but actual brain activity. Okay. So, and this happens because muscles are far away from the you know, relatively far away and are uh, isolated by the poorly conductive skull. Uh, uh, when you talk about ECOG electrodes. We all know when we use EEG electrodes, then muscle artifacts on the contrary have very focal patterns. This is because the muscles and the electrodes are separated by very well conducting skin, right? So therefore in ECOG we have an opposite situation, but you shouldn't forget about the TAN because TAN is a huge muscle and it also causes causes a, and it doesn't have a direct bone, right? Which separates it from the brain, but it's still far away, okay? And hopefully the patterns that you would see uh, will be spread out, okay? So, all right. So we decided to build our decoder using so-called interpretable building block in modern deep learning literature, they would call it a head, okay? Like in attention would have heads. Here you could also probably call it a head. And this works very similarly to how the simple detector receiver would work, okay? The simple detector receiver would have an antenna which would collect the data from space. Then it would have frequency selective contour, right? Which would focus on specific frequency band on specific station. And then it would have the demodulator which would extract the envelope or basically the, the information 
from the, let's say, amplitude modulated signal, okay? So very similarly, our, our, our decoder would have a spatial filter that in fact works as an antenna. Uh, then it would have bandpass filter that works at the, at the frequency selective circuit. And it has a rectifier and low pass filter which work both as a diode and the, um, this is RC circuit here where R is the resistance of the, of the microphone itself, right? That would smooth the output of the rectifier, okay? All right, so this, this kind of thing, when applied to the data, is capable to get tuned to a specific band and uh, then extract the, extract the envelope or basically instantaneous power within this band, okay? So uh, as I already mentioned, I think already three times, that we are not only interested in building a decoder, but we are also interested in create in interpreting the weights, okay? So basically by looking at W, at the weights of this single head, we want to understand the spatial location of the population, of the neuronal population, uh, the data are coming from, and that we want to understand which population is pivotal for, for the particular decoding task or for the operation of this particular head, if we have multiple heads, okay? Uh, then. Also, and this has kind of been attempted already, but I don't think it was done quite, quite carefully, but I'll show you why. But also, we also by interpreting the weights of the bandpass filter, we can also understand which band this head is focused on, right? And then by comparing the band where, you know, let's say high frequency or low frequency or middle frequency uh, with the spatial extent that we'll, we see in by interpreting vector W, we can make conclusion, not only about which population is important, but we also can make conclusion that what we see and the head is operating, not tuned to the muscles, but rather tuned to the neuronal activity. Because I, I, I do believe that there is a very, very strong influence of muscular activity in, in, in many BCI applications. And since we are not, it's very difficult to develop this technology when working with the target population, right? Those people who cannot already speak, for instance, right? Uh, when you want to finesse the technology, right? When you want to develop it, uh, then when working with non-target populations, with people who have been implanted for their own medical reasons, then this muscular stuff and other kind of artifacts need to be carefully been taken care of and excluded, okay? So that, but in order to understand how to properly interpret the weights, you need to understand that the patterns are not filters, okay? I will give you an example, uh, like real life example. If you have a, if you have your system that is trying to match the target, basically you can say that you, it's equivalent to you, for instance, listening to someone. Okay, if you're listening to someone, you're trying to tune your ears to turn your head so that you're hearing this particular person, right? But then, uh, but then when you are, when you have another person speaking and it's kind of an interference and you want to tune away from this second person, you're turning your head in such a position that on the one hand, you are listening to the target guy, but you're also trying to cancel as much as possible the signal from that interfering person, okay? Uh, and that's exactly how the um, how the uh, the filter, how, how the uh, adaptive filters behave. Okay, they really learn not only to tune to the target, but they also learn to tune away from the interference. And in case of the system that comprises spatial and temporal processing, this is done together by W by adjusting spatial weight and by adjusting temporal filter weights, okay? We don't, we don't adjust these weights, we just make them be in a low pass filter, that's it, okay? To reduce the number of parameters to tune, okay? So now, uh, Stefan Haufer, back in 2014, has, has presented a mathematical explanation of this, re of this example that I have just given to you. Uh, and he has shown not without, not without an error, we, we, I, uh, here it's a fixed, uh, that uh, it is possible to recover from the spatial weights, it is possible to recover the actual pattern of your source, okay? So let's look a little bit into the equations here. So now this is a very simple case when you have a signal that comes from 
a single source with topography G. It has just a vector of coefficients which describe the, the, the source, right? This, this guy is called pattern. Okay, and the pattern gets stronger or weaker depending on the activity of the signal itself, of the source itself. And then you have noise. And noise may be not spatially wide, okay? Noise may be coming from very specific directions, may have very, very, very complex spatial structure, okay? And therefore we model noise like this, but this is not very important for this kind of derivation, okay? So then you want to extract signal S of T, S hat of T, as a spatial, spatially filtered X of T, okay? And then if you substitute X of T model in here and apply the orthogonality principle, which basically states that in the error of your decoding, they should be, uh, the error of your decoding should be orthogonal to your data. Basically, if you have any information in your error that is present in the data, that means that you're not decoding well enough, okay? Tune your weights more in order to be able, in order to orthogonalize your error against the data, because that means that you are at the most optimum, you can't do better. Of course, this is for Gaussian data, right? Uh, so, and then from this, you can easily derive that the pattern is equal to, by, to the covariance matrix of your data, of your X, multiplied by the weights, okay? So you have to take care of the spatial structure of your data. If the data has specific structure, then you need to take, to take it into account when interpreting weight, weights if you want to get access to G, okay, to the pattern. And the pattern is something that describes where the source is. This is a physical property of the source, okay? It's, it's corresponding to, it, it's basically supported by electromagnetic modeling of propagating the signal from the dipoles to the sensors, okay? From the sources to the sensors, okay? So you can, you can nobody knows the sigma, sigma S. And so you can simply say that G is proportional to covariance matrix of your data multiplied by your weights vector. And this weight vector is learned, adapted by your system. And this rule works only if your system is at the optimum and the orthogonality principle holds, okay? So here's a simple illustration from, from Stefan's paper in 2014. Imagine that you have your two signals, okay? Two sensors only. And you have one source, which is present in the signal from one sensor and is absent in the signal from the other sensor, okay? And then, and then you have the same noise, exactly the same noise added to the first sensor and minus this noise, for instance, or actually there's a mistake here. So plus, right, it has to be plus here. Uh, oh no, minus, yeah, minus, all right. My, my, minus, my, minus noise, this opposite uh, polarity of noise in the other sensor, okay? Well, clearly, if you want to decode S of T, you need to take this guy and add to this guy, right? Then the two noises will annihilate and you will get S of T intact, right? So the proper processing is one times one multiplied by X1, X2, right? So your filter weights are one, one, but they are not equal to the pattern of your source because this pattern tells you like in some hypothetical scenario that the source is very close to, 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 to electrode one and far away from electrode two, right? But importantly, the decoder uses information from the second electrode because it helps the decoder to tune away from the noise, right? To get rid of this noise. If you didn't have this, you would have a mixture of signal plus noise. But if you have another electrode where you have some, some, some activity that resembles the noise in the electrodes that carry the useful signal, then the decoder will use those electrodes and many, many sensitivity analysis methods would pick this up and pick this electrode as important and it is important for the decoding, but it has nothing to do with the pattern. Why pattern is important was illustrated in Stefan's paper very nicely. If you look in now into most more probably um, conventional SSD, not SSD, sorry, EEG scenario, is this is how people used to do. They obtained, let's say SSD filter or ICA, or whatever. They obtained spatial filters. They looked at the spatial filters and they tried to fit dipole in order to find where this damn source is. Okay, and they were getting very low correlation between the forward model and the actual, actual, you know, actual profile of distribution of the of the weights, right? But then once you use this recipe, you get these very nice patterns. You fit dipoles, and now they're in proper locations. 
and you get fantastic correlations with the model. Okay, so the use of pattern allows you to get into the guts of where the sources are, okay, and to understand the physical properties of your sources. Uh, and that's the great contribution of Stefan Eads, okay, for this neuroimaging field where he introduced these ideas from the estimation theory that are there, but the community was some, for some reason not aware of this, okay. So now, uh, let's do next, a little bit, let's move next step. Uh, we so far looked at only spatial filter, right? Now let's look at our architecture, understand that our architecture has not only the temporal filter, the spatial filter, but it also has a temporal filter or frequency selective circuit, right? So you have to understand that temporal filtering is simply a convolution of your input data, which is shown with blue here. This, this filter weights with filter pulse response that is shown in red. Okay, and in each time slice, you're simply computing the inner product between the chunk of the data that is overlapped by this red pulse response and the pulse response, right? And so basically at each time slice, your processing can be viewed for each chunk as spatial filter multiplied by this guy and then temporal filter multiplied from the right, right? Because you simply, all you need, you need to take time samples and combine them with these coefficients. And these coefficients H are called pulse responses, pulse response of your filter, okay? And therefore, we can, in parallel to thinking about spatial patterns, right? We can think about temporal patterns and, but temporal patterns are better temporal filtering patterns, right? But they are better viewed in the frequency domain, right? Because we use convolutions here and stuff. I'm not going to go into details here, but they're described in our relatively recent Petrosian et al. paper in general neuroengineering, where we derive all this formula and let me explain you what they are, okay? So the spatial pattern for ECOG would look like this, right? So this is our grid. This is the map that mimics this grid layout. And basically, if you look at the filter and if you look at the pattern, you see very significant differences between the two. And you can, and the, the same as in Haufa's case, you, are, you, have, you see you, in the EEG, you see that the, the pattern is more spread out which corresponds to deeper sources, but it can also be used to feed the electromagnetic model even to ECOG data, right? So, but then you also have temporal pattern that's better viewed in the frequency domain and it describes the frequency domain properties of the neuronal population that is pivotal, pivotal for each particular head, right? For each particular head or branch of our network, right? So see, you can look at it this way, um, by, by training spatial weights, you are getting access to the topography of your source, right? You've trained them and you then use them to obtain the topography. Here, by training temporal weights, you are getting access to the frequency domain properties of your, of your source signal, okay? And then you can visualize this like uh, in this way. So usually, typically, when people interpret the result of the spatial temporal combined processing and these deep neural networks with this uh, EEG net and uh, alike, right? They just take the Fourier transform of the of the of the temporal filter weights and they obtain this kind of a blue uh, black curve and they say, well, great. I mean, our filter, our our algorithm focuses on high frequency data on the gamma. This is what we expect, and this is fantastic. And this is right. This is they they're reasonably right. Except that if you want to somehow fit some models or some electro, some, some neurodynamical models uh, to, to describe the activity of your population and to study it further. As with dipoles, when we talk about spatial properties, you need to look into the frequency domain pattern and not the filter, right? Because filter is trying to tune away from the interference sources that are present in these low frequencies. And therefore filter itself has real, after filter and see, we get output, which is the green curve, which is the spectrum, which is a green curve, which is indeed only high frequencies, right? The 75 to 100 and from 100 to let's say 125, right? But the pattern of the source itself is different and it can be obtained via this relation, okay? And then looking at this pattern, you can, and matching this pattern with the spatial extent, you can, infer some information which ensures your good sleep, right? That your decoder is not working with muscle data, which is especially important in speech decoding. Okay, I'll show you. Okay, so now, so basically our network looks like this. 
you have um, we have multiple heads, multiple how you call it, multiple branches, if you will, and then output of these branches are envelopes, and they get fed to the fully connected layer that then somehow learns to combine those envelopes and output our kinematics. Okay, so and now I will just simply reiterate what I have just said uh, that the uh, when we are interpreting the spatial weights. Uh, we need, ah, yes, one, one important thing, which I, which I probably could have somehow slipped away from your attention, that an important thing here is that when interpreting spatial weights of this branch, of let's say this first branch, you need to take care, you need to, to pay attention to the band pass filter because, well, there are two arguments. The first argument, because band pass filter and the spatial filter and you know, linear uh, temporal filter are linear, right? You can, you can swap them, right? You can put band pass filter at each channel first, and then look at the spatial for the spatial filter, right? And nothing will change, right? Uh, that means that when interpreting spatial filter weights, you have to take spatial covariance of band pass filter data specific to that particular branch, and vice versa. When interpreting spatial weights, you need to take uh, you need to take uh, you, you you need to take the data filtered with the band pass filter um, of this particular branch because those artifacts that were taken care of by the band pass filter do not will not be used by the tuning algorithm to to train the spatial weights against that source because it has already been taken care of by the temporal filter and that and, and vice versa okay and that is often missed by the researchers when interpreting the weights. And I will show you relatively significant difference um, between naive pattern interpretation and this proper one, okay? So basically when interpreting spatial weights, you need to take care of the temporal filter of this branch. And when interpreting uh, tem temporal, temporal filter weights, you need to take care, you need to take into account the spatial filter properties uh, and the, the, the sp power spectral density of the input signal to this band pass filter, which basically passed through the spatial filter, right? Okay, so that's you know, you've seen already, but let's look at the interpretation. Okay, so uh, that's the, the decoding, uh, decoding of uh, different fingers, and you can see at spatial patterns, and these spatial patterns, which you, you, you can even see some sort of, um, some sort of somatotopy, because uh, let's say, uh, I don't know, so let's say index finger is appears appears to be below below than the little finger, right? So according to the lower than the index finger, according to the somatotopy, and the middle finger appears to be somewhere in between. So yeah, so it sounds like we get reasonable, re reasonable physiologically plausible uh, um, interpretation. And if you look at the frequency domain pattern, that's here's an interesting thing. You, uh, this, this one is, uh, um, uh, you, you can see that you, although this, the temporal filter weights focus only on high frequencies, the, you, you, the true pattern gets a little bit scaled to more the range from 50 to 100. And for the other branch, for other head, you see that the, the pattern uses both low, appears to be present in the low frequencies and the high frequencies as well, okay? And for the speech decoding task, I will show you very, very nicely how the spatial extent is um, going together with the frequency domain, with the frequency domain picture, okay? So, and this is for the, if you apply this to non-invasive EEG data uh, for Berlin BCI competition, then if you interpret, th those are the weights of the decoder, uh, those are pat naive patterns, now naive spatial patterns without taking the frequency domain um, information, frequency domain filter. But this one is when you take it in, in, into account, you see that you are, instead of this, unclear activity, you get very nicely motor focus, activity with motor focus or pattern with motor focus uh, when interpreted properly, okay? For us, for the other two, the results are not that different, okay? So, yeah. So that, that was about uh, the first part that was uh, about the motor decoder and that contained this methodological aspect that I wanted to focus today on. And I must apologize if it was a bit boring, okay? But I, you can take a look at this Petrosian et al. paper, which describes the, the guts of it, the details, and, but I, be, I believe this is important stuff for methodological guys who are working on in this field, okay? Then the, 
try to close the loop and try to provide the stimulation. So we had for this, we had a patient who she was implanted with only a single ECOG grid and we localized this NEG location of the sensory cortex where you know the, the locate, lo localized the, uh, the sensory evoked potential when we stimulated her right finger with electrical current. Uh, and uh, then it, the, the doctors originally asked us to find the sensory area. So we did find it. And then they implanted the grid because they needed for the, the, the seizure, seizure, seizure clinical picture was such that it involved the, the, um, the sensory area, okay? And then we um, involved, we asked her to do this, so the variant of X task, so, sorry, sorry. So basically what, what she had to do, she had to collect the, the fragile Christmas balls, okay? And put them in the, in the basket. Uh, and this was, this is just the, the sensory part, okay? This is not, there's no motor decoding here. Uh, and the, the motor is, the, 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 the motor dynamics is captured by the perception neuron thin. So, but she is not, she doesn't see her index finger. And then she's very gradually trying to grab the, the ball, not to destroy it, okay? So she's been doing it. And this, this stimulation, she had more successes uh, then, then, uh, then, then she had these no stimulations, and we also didn't restrict the timing. But when we spoke to the person, she said that when the stimulation was on, she felt some, of course, not very natural, some kind of pressing or like wave kind of thing in the index finger, and it was much more natural anyway to perform this task because she kind of feel was feeling when she touched the ball, and she could do it much more naturally and much faster. Okay. So on average, we did several runs and on average it's here, but again, the time was not, the, the, the time was not limited. And if we limited the time, probably the disbalance between steam with no steam would be higher. And again, the same story, we, we should have used more, more time, more attempts with this patient to learn, to teach her, to get accustomed to the system, okay? So, uh, and of course, when you do this kind of simulation, you need to take care of, if you do decoding, simultaneous decoding, you need to take care of the stimulation artifact. And we did this on the simulations, both mathematical and um, physical simulation, where we uh, simulated the, 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 the distributed in space and time stimulation, stimulating sequence and used recursive least squares algorithm to get rid of the stimulation because we know the stimulation sequence and the algorithm is, which, which operates the prosthetic limb, theoretically knows the stimulating sequence, right? And can use it to freeze the data from this artifact, okay? If we tried, we compared two approaches where we use RLS thing or we train neural network on the data with stimulation on, which is, you know, this is the second one is less, less probable to be used in real life circumstances because it's very difficult to collect a lot of data along with the stimulation and to cover all possible patterns and parameters of stimulation. And so that, that's a physical model. I'm sorry, those are in Russian, but they just describe different parts. That was back like a year ago when we used the um, non-GTEC amplifier. Now we're using also GTEC amplifier for, for this kind of game. Uh, and, you know, for this research overall, because it uh, uh, gives uh, very high sampling rates and, you know, it's very convenient. Okay, so anyway, so we compared, we compared for different sources, we compared different algorithms, we compared RLS-based and, and neural network learn the stimulations, and we can see that recursive least squares outperforms uh, the, other, the other algorithm, and of course, the network that is not, the naive network that is not aware of stimulations performs very poorly. So we now thinking of integrating this, all these things together into a brand new patient that will have all these technologies combined in ECOG-based interface, okay? So now I switch to speech processes. I have um, 20 minutes left, but I'll try to do it like in 15 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions. Uh, well, it was a great talk, as I already mentioned, by Tanya Schulz. And there's also many groups and very nice introduction about other groups who are working in, the, in this field. Uh, the, the very well-known group at UCSF uh, by Edward Chan. Uh, and uh, that's just sim several reasons why speech decoding, speech processes is interesting. Okay, and uh, as Tanya already described that the, the, the uh, actual speech, information in the actual speech signal is not, it's not that much of information in fact, okay? Uh, because uh, what it is, it's basically the, the switches between different configuration of the articulatory tract, articulatory machinery 
that is actually quite well captured by so-called either linear prediction coefficients or ML Captrum, ML Spectrum. But in the LPC, it's enough to have like 20 LPC coefficients, linear prediction coding coefficients. And you can see how, how they remain constant over some particular time interval, right? Which means that they correspond to very specific configuration of the of the of the articulatory track that is filtering the incoming incoming excitation and this incoming excitation uh, has already been mentioned can be either harmonic excitation or it can be noisy excitation okay so uh and all we need to do basically is <laughs> all we need to do is just to take the ecog data and decode these guys okay once we know these guys we basically know what the person has been speaking uh or imagining to speak okay so there have been a lot of work, as I already, as, as Tanya also presented, and um, uh, that this is the piece from Chunk, and you saw very nice pictures of how how the different electrodes are needed to discriminate between different vowels. Uh, and we, because we just started this work like a year ago, even yeah, about a year ago. So we thought what new we could do. Well, first of all, we want to use, of course, our neural network, which is interpretable and compact, and blah blah blah. And then let's say we want to go into some sort of um, uh, some maybe practical thing which would use few electrodes, okay? And those few electrodes could come from stereo EEG shafts, right? A single shaft that can be implanted to a little hole uh, in the in the in this in the skull, and that perhaps if it's implanted in the proper location, perhaps it may furnish signals enough to do reasonable decoding, okay? So we also opted for decoding separate words as a trade-off between flexibility and accuracy. Um, and we also believe that maybe, like you may ask, why not use UT arrays, right? For instance, or things like those that record multi-unit activity, which indeed gives access to unique data and, and, and fantastic decoding results, right? Like this work by Krishna Shenoy, where they decoded motor activity when imagining handwritten characters, right? So, well, the answer is probably maybe if you are working with stereo EEG electrodes, we are focusing on those integral signals, right? And learning mixed signals and learning to unmix them. Maybe in the future, we may avoid craniotomy at all. Let's say if we use 10 road, uh, st stand road, uh, pent electrodes, like those developed by Synchron Company and Thomas Oxley. In, in Australia, okay? So that's sort of an idea, okay? So that's the standard road electrode. The nice thing is implanted into a VM and it gets expanded. It's like stents used for the, for the heart arteries. The technology is the same, except that it has electrodes and it has wires and it has the trans transmitter under your hand, uh, under your arm, so that you can, you can get access to the brain activity data. Okay, so our speech decoding, we did, we so far played the avert speech decoding with actual speech, and uh, this is itself a great challenge, uh, because as I said, there are many, many possible sources of artifacts. Um, we are now moving into the imaginary speech, uh, and, you know, moving there gradually, basically, as Tanya described through so first uh, silent speech, then the imagined speech, I don't think we'll be able to do the inner speech with reasonable accuracy, but at least those two should be. Okay, so that this first patient, she had these several shafts implanted, and in one shaft, we observed speech arrest when stimulating certain currents, and we also looked at the mutual information between the speech envelope and the data, and over the same signal channels, we, up, we, we saw high mutual information, which we thought that the electrode miraculously appeared to be in the right area, Braca, I believe, uh, and then we can use it for, for our initial speech decoding attempt, okay? So our architecture comprises two steps. Basically, the first step is to decode male spectrogram. So we do not decode LPC coefficients, also I'll show you some results uh, that historically we started with male spectrogram, but pretty much the same result is possible if you do LPC decoding here as an intermediate target, okay? So we train our network to decode male spectrogram, and then we use 2D convolutional network applied to this um, to this male spectrogram, decoded male spectrogram from ECOG data to decode the words, okay, to classify the words. So that's the result for the two patients, how the um, actual and the decoded male spectrogram, male spectrogram looks, okay. 
Uh, and then we also use, um, it's not shown here, but will be shown next. We use the LSTM layer in addition to our previous network and the output of the last LSTM layer, we also input into the uh, into the fully connected network into, no, I believe in here into this fully connected network, yes, to, to decode our ML spectrograms, okay? So that we use internal representation and it improves things actually quite a bit. So here are the results that on the top there, are the accuracies are outdated, they're slightly better now, but anyway, the, the confusion matrix looks like this, different words, uh, 26 words plus silent group. That's the confusion matrix. So seems to be reasonable. And this is a distribution between different words, though the Russians, so I will not be reading them to you. So, um, and then look at the interpretation. Again, we had two patients. The first patient, she was and she was implanted with this kind of thing. And we used only one shaft for decoding. So we somehow tried to look into this ecological setting, right? So that you can get the patient, maybe even in ambulatory setting, implant him or his or her with this kind of shaft and that, there, there she goes with speech prosthesis, okay? Uh, and then the other patient had this ECOG stripes implanted still through a relatively little hole, of course, bigger than this, but it's a little hole. And then they managed in St. Petersburg, they managed to somehow transport these strips over along the cortex, and this is this is the uh, subdural implantation. Okay, so if we interpret the VH, you can see you can observe this structure that we hope to see that the the high frequency orange one, the high frequency pattern, corresponds to compact population. Those are the six contacts of this single stereo EG shaft. Okay, we can see only that dominantly spatial pattern comprises only the first one electrode, okay, and it has higher frequencies. And then more spatially diffused pattern corresponds to low frequencies, okay? And then also somewhat diffused pattern corresponds to also relatively low frequencies. Here we also have this artifact, this 50 hertz artifact um, present, okay? So the same picture for another patient that we see spatially distributed areas corresponding to low frequencies and spatially compact areas corresponding to relatively higher frequencies and see very nice gradient here. You can see the distributed, less distributed focal, and you can see how it moves into the frequency domain to higher. So that sort of makes me sleep better, not well, but better uh, if I didn't, as compared to the case, if I didn't see this kind of a pattern that is pertinent to the neuro neurological signal, okay? And this is and this is a evidence from our MEG studies that, I mean, we just started them with speech decoding. You can see, you see a lot, we looked, did MEG, we do, we did like ICA components, and then we looked at the, at the mutual information between the ICA component and the different speech representations. And we found some components with, with relatively high and we also look, filtered these components in a very high frequency, like starting from 100 hertz. Uh, and we found a lot of muscle related artifacts, the jaw artifact, the tongue artifact. And now we are working to show that uh, basically you can learn to decode without these artifacts. And then when interpret, you are finding the sources which are located in anatomically plausible areas, okay? So that's the same thing I just wanted to. Yeah, then we did some additional analysis. We played, as I said, we played with different inter intermediate targets, right? And what's interesting is that we, we see more or less reproducible picture between two patients, although these two patients are recorded with, even with two different techniques in different cities. Uh, we see that the uh, different kind of intermediate representations uh, deliver different decoding accuracy. Um, and then you also, we compared it, we compared our network, the simple network envelope detector network that I described to you plus LSTM with more complex networks. And we found that our network, the simple network, given the amount of data outperforms the other approaches. We also looked at uh, causal, non-causal and both decoding. And we found that causal decoding works, works, but of course, of course, non-causal, uh, non both non-causal, well, anti-causal decoding is green. No, anti-causal is, is red like this, you know, this, this, this kind of thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's somewhere in the middle here uh, for this patient and lower on this. And, and when you use both future and the past, then you of course decode better, but this is not the right thing to do if you want to do speech prosthesis, right? And then we also compared which groups of channels decoding the accuracy, which which of the groups gives you best the best accuracy, and those are these groups that we yeah here, those are these groups 
the one that we had speech arrest for one patient and some uh, deformation of the tongue for another patient, okay? So uh, then also there is a bummer called Elect microphone effect, which may be present due to vibrations and due to not very nice contact and the changes in capacity, capacitance in the electrical capacitance. And then your speech signal may leak into the channels, into the ECOG channels or your stereo EG channels. We did the check, we didn't observe it. So that's another reason why we think it's working truly from the brain data. And we also did, that was a synchronous set, this was synchronous setting where we simply had the words, we cut the data around this word and we were decoding and those accuracies that I reported correspond to this. We also did a synchronous setting where we simply were looking for the best word, which best, uh, more, more like what Tanya described. Uh, and there we obtained this kind of um, receiver operating characteristic, precision recall curves. Uh, which is not great, but it shows you that you get recall of 0.5, this 0.5 precision, which means that, if, you know, every two words, uh, you can get the word decoded properly in 50% of cases out of 27, 26 words. I don't think it's very bad, but of course it needs to be improved for the real use. Okay, so now I conclude that the, I showed to you how to build motor decoder uh, with manual, without manual feature engineering and this is physiological interpretable network. Then I focused on the details of how to interpret this way. The weights of this network was a little bit of methodologically heavy. And I'm, I apologize for if it was just a little bit more boring than you expected, okay? And, but, but this interpretation is important because it allows not only to, to find the spatial properties of the pivotal populations, but also to look at the dynamical properties of activity by exploring the frequency domain patterns, not filter weights, but, but, uh, but patterns of your sources. And then I showed to how possibly it is possible, how, how it's possible to create with the same architecture without manual feature engineering, how to create, how to, how to create the speech decoder uh, and take care of muscle artifacts, microphone effects. And then also beware of channel leakage. If you use the same amplifier, Record the record the speech at the ECOG. That this is very critical, especially for the high impedance channels. And I still, to, for sanity, I would recommend using separate amplifier for that uh, for audio recording. Uh, and I mentioned that the working with integral signals from ECOG stereo EG may pave the road towards the use of uh, synchron kind of electrodes, which would not require craniotomy. And of course, to do the proper speech decoding and also motor decoding for the patient, it would be great to somehow develop tools to determine location of implantation, but you have to keep in mind that the patient who needs it, he or she already cannot speak or cannot move. And so that makes things quite difficult, okay? So I would like to show you again my dream team. Uh, and I would like to thank you for attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. This was a very nice presentation. You can also see it in the chat that people liked it a lot. Also the technical details. So it's good to learn something about signal processing in the Spring School. Mm -hmm. we, we have also questions, which are very good. So Darun is saying he's a beginning in the Mac domain and was watching your talk and the work with resting state EMG for dementia. In standard data is usually recorded during eye closed relaxation in subjects. My question is about what are the standard and accurate approaches, how to epoch and convert continuous data into trials when you are doing MEG? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think, uh, thank you very much for the question. I think the it's a standard thing for EEG as well that you first, well, the, the problem when you convert data into trials is that you have transient artifacts, right? When you cut the data into small chunks and then at the beginning of the chunk, and especially if you use filtering uh, in with zero phase filtering, right? Go in one direction and the other direction, you have art transient artifact at the beginning and the end of the segment. So therefore it's recommended that you first filter the data in the frequency band that you're interested in or get read artifacts, let's say 50, 100 or 60, 120 hertz. And then only you, you, you chunk them into the, into the epochs, 
Okay, uh, an alter alternative approach would be to use epochs of greater size, have some transient to allow for the transients to die off, right? So you just simply have greater greater extent on the left and on the right, so that after filtering you can focus only on the central part of the epoch. Okay, so uh, what are the what what we what we use to remove artifacts? Well, we find that uh, ICA, you know, just more or less standard ICA, followed by uh, mutual information metrics with eye channels, uh, with some muscle activity that you, you should also record uh, works quite well. So you can rank your your IC, your ICA components according to the value of mutual information, and then you explore also the spatial patterns and make the decision. Uh, they, I, I I would not recommend using some, especially if you're interested in physiology of stuff that you're working on, I would not recommend using automatic tools in this because yes, you will spend the week cleaning your data, but you will know that you what you have done is done properly. And yeah, and also I would, re I, I would recommend if you use ICA, you record the W's and stuff, you know, all, all, so that you, you know them. Uh, and then you can reproduce the IC analysis because IC analysis every time gives you slightly different unmixing matrix and you'd better save this unmixing matrix, which doesn't uh, use a lot of space uh, on the disk, but will allow you to reproduce the components. Okay. So. And em Emmanuel is asking, what are the trade-offs between using S, TFT and wavelet transformation? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, the wavelets are known to be very nice in maintaining the time versus frequency resolution, okay? Everybody know, oh, not everybody, I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, it's, no, it's known that uh, you, can, you, can, you can detect, uh, you can either localize signal in the frequency domain or you can, you can localize it in time, right? Because in order to understand the frequency of the signal, or you have to absorb the signal and look how many times, let's say it crosses zero, for instance, right? In order to understand which frequency band it belongs to, right? Therefore, wavelets are designed to take care, to take great care of this, okay? Uh, and short-term Fourier transform is not, is not particularly designed for that, okay? Uh, wavelets have, like when you apply wavelets, you usually apply the same shape but just scale. So number of periods is the same, but the length of your chunk is different because you have the, the and the accuracy of local, local and frequency domain resolution is the same for all bands, right? Because you use the same number of periods, right? And STFT is, is not is not designed for that. Okay. So that's that would be the short answer for this. What? And Alex, on the last day, we are having an exam. So what is your preferred important question that we should ask our attendees? What's important? I would, I would, uh, I would ask people to think critically and to imagine sources of confound that may arise when you're, decode, when you're creating uh, interfaces based on the um, invasive data, let's say motor interfaces and speech decoded interfaces. What are the confounds that may allow, that may give you nice, great results, but the information will not be coming from the brain, okay? And be, so that they find an answer for this question in addition to what I have already described, and they will be uh, aware of this in the future. Okay, so thank you very much for the nice presentation. Thank you. you can thank see you in very the much chat. for inviting. Yeah, people uh, liked it a lot. Thank you. I, you know what? I will copy the. I, I will try to. If you can send me the the the, the, the questions, I will be very. Let me. I, I will. Don't don't close it. I will. Uh, I will. I will copy and I will answer, so I can send them to you. Uh, the answers you can forward. To it would be nice if you could. Answer the open questions. Just click on click on the type answer button, and but then you it, can. Ah, I can I can do it now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can do it right okay. away. Okay. Uh, okay. Would be nice. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, Thank you very much. See yeah. you soon. It was nice to have you. Thank you. And then we are moving to the next speaker, which is Aisha Gündüz from University of Florida. Aisha, can you hear us? Yes. Good morning. Nice Good morning. to see you. Wow, you got the nice.